have 22 people online now and um, thanks Great. everybody for joining us today live. We are recording this session today on integrated pest management for small farms, but a lot of today's workshop is actually going to take place in breakout rooms, which aren't recorded. So, you know, basically if you're not here live in person, only you'd only glean about 20% out of the final recording for this. So thanks so much for taking the effort to join us live this morning from wherever you're joining from. We aren't going to do roundtable introductions to start because we're going to have lots of time for that in our breakout rooms today. So I'll start with a brief introduction. My name is Rachel Rusin and I coordinate the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisor Program. This is an agricultural extension program in the Kootenai and Boundary region that's funded by the regional districts of Kootenai Boundary, Central Kootenai, East Kootenai, and Columbia Basin Trust. Um, oh yeah, Marjo is just putting the note in the box here that um, you can, you can write in the chat box where you're actually physically joining from. Um, I'm physically joining from Roslyn, unceded territory of the Sinaiaks and Tanaha. And on this team, on the pictures on the right here, you'll see Danny Smart. She's my team colleague in the East Kootenai. She's in Kimberley physically. So I'm physically in Roslyn. She's physically in Kimberley. And today our workshop host, Drew Yates, she's in Ladner in the Fraser Valley and Marjo Desaro, she is in Pemberton. So we have great um, provincial representation here. I, a very short background on how this event came to be today is um, I'm an environmental farm plan advisor as well. And so is Marjo, an environmental farm plan advisor. And, and we're both consultants who wear many hats. And we knew that she was doing this project with the Climate Action Initiative, specifically on integrated pest management for specific pests, but working with small farms. And through our work with the Kootenai and Boundary Farm Advisors, we know that a lot of the large scale farm management strategies just simply aren't that relevant at the small scale. And Marjo and I have been talking about some of the common pests that are real nuisance pests to producers in our region, um, such as like the carrot rust fly and spider mites in greenhouse operations. And so this event today has spawned from our conversations um, between myself and Marjo and also her working on the development on these fact sheets. Um, on specific pests, specifically for small farms. So these fact sheets were just launched in the last, within the last year. And so Marjo is just like in the knowledge transfer rollout stage. So without further ado, I would like to welcome Drew and Marjo. Excellent, thank you so much, Rachel. Um, great, well, my first couple of slides of intro, I can kind of breeze past, thank you for that introduction. Um, Marjo and I have been working together for uh, the past several years uh, at ES Crop Consults. And yeah, Marjo was previously based out of the Fraser Valley and now is based out of the Pemberton Valley and I'm still in the Fraser Valley. So that's kind of the context that we're coming to this from. Um, and let's... So before we get into the content of the workshop itself, I do want to um, uh, give a thank you to our funders. This workshop is a part of a workshop series. We're gonna do a number of other workshops after this um, on the same topic. And this workshop series is a part of a bigger three-year project that uh, Rachel sort of alluded to. So uh, Marjo and I have been working on a project that's been funded uh, provincially and uh, federally um, administered by the Investment Agriculture Foundation of BC and the Climate and Agriculture Initiative of BC. And again, Rachel already mentioned this, but I will plug it again. Uh, part of this three-year project has been developing these field guides that are really geared towards the context of small-scale mixed cropping operations. Um, and so there's 12 of these field guides that are available online through the Climate Agriculture BC website. I will post a link to uh, where you can find that in the chat um, shortly. Um, another reason I'm mentioning these field guides is that later in the workshop, uh, you will be referring directly to some of these field guides as a part of uh, the activities that we have planned. So you can prepare yourself for that as well. Okay, getting into the workshop itself. So uh, when Marjo and I were planning this workshop, we kind of realized, uh, had to recognize that we're not going to be able to hold a workshop that introduces you to every single potential pest in every single potential crop that you might ever grow. 
Um, but what we can do is provide you with some tools um, related to problem solving that you can then apply in your own specific farm contexts, no matter what it is that you end up facing. So this workshop is focused around three main frameworks that we're gonna go through and practice together. The first one is the six components of integrated pest management or IPM. The second, we're gonna do a problem solving framework that's related to pest identification. And we're gonna focus mostly on diseases in that one. And then the last framework we're gonna go through is more focused on management and decision-making about management. Um, and then at the end of the workshop, we're gonna have at least 30 minutes uh, set aside for Q&A and just general discussion um, to cover maybe more specific questions that we weren't able to cover in the workshop. And also for all of you to chime in, I, I wanna recognize that there's a lot of experience in this virtual room that we're all in here together. And so uh, we want to, to be able to utilize that as well. And we'll have a little break in the middle as well. <laughs> Great news. Okay, a few housekeeping notes. So cameras, if you can turn them on, that would be great for us. We are going to kind of cut away from presentation and be looking for people's responses to certain things, especially when we go into the breakouts, having your cameras on will be really helpful for engagement. Um, for your microphones, just a reminder to please have them off when you're not speaking. We will be having breakout groups later on uh, for some of these activities. And we will be accessing um, some documents right here on the slide. It says through Google Drive. That's not true in this case. Those documents are uploaded through the KBFA uh, website. Um, and we will share that link in the chat a little bit later once it uh, becomes more relevant as well. But there's some documents that we'll be referring to. And yeah, if you have any technical issues that come up throughout this workshop, please uh, just contact Marjo or myself or Rachel. Um, and we'll do our best to, to get you sorted. Is there anyone else, is there someone else that should be contacted, Rachel, or is that, that correct? Uh, you can contact me as well, Danny. Great, thank you, Danny. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, both, of us, both of us are like semi-medium, not yeah. experts in Zoom, <laughs> reluctant experts. <laughs> yeah, so we can try. <laughs> Great, between us, we'll see what we can we'll, do. Yeah. <laughs> Thank you, Danny. <laughs> okay. Um, and yeah, in the realm of engagement, I know we're doing this virtually and that can be a bit challenging, um, but we are going to try to uh, be as interactive as possible. Um, we ask that you use the, the like hands up or emoting uh, options to let us know if you uh, have a question and we can call on you, um, or we're going to be asking you to input information into the chat. So that's another avenue. Um, like I said, we're going to have a break around 10.30 a.m., so you can look forward to that. Um, we're going to do our best to stay on time. Uh, we have three hours together, and we have a lot of content we want to cover. So Marjo and I are going to be doing our best to start and end on time, and we just ask the same of you. So when we go for a break and we say we're going to be back at a certain time, just try to, try to be timely, and we will be doing the same. Um, in the realm of staying on time, we're also going to be doing our best to stay on topic. So if you do have questions that come up throughout the workshop, feel free to ask them in the moment, but just know that if we feel like they might be better addressed at the end during the Q&A, we might park them and save them for that time. Um, and I think that is it. So I'm going to pass the... Uh, the sharing capabilities over to Marjo, and she's going to start us off by talking about the six components of IPM. All right, so please let me know if you are seeing my presentation. Okay, and we're just going to have to go, sorry, I'm just going to go directly to my section. Thank you, Drew, for this introduction. So we will be, so you're seeing my screen right now? So we will be starting with uh, the six components of IPM. And Drew mentioned that, but I'm gonna mention it again. Uh, we're, we're, you're gonna hear us say IPM a lot and we're referring to integrated pest management. And I've put a definition here just to start with. So what is integrated pest management? It's a system of crop production that manages pests. So we're talking about all kinds of pests 
insects, diseases, weeds, mites, uh, using a combination of tools um, in an economically and environmentally sustainable way. And to go into the six components, I will briefly mention them all here, um, but I will go uh, deeper into each of these steps or components in the following uh, slides. So the first step is to prevent pest problem. Uh, the second step is to monitor populations of pests and the beneficial organism. And then we're wanting to understand and identify pests and beneficial organism. Step four, we're using economic threshold, but in other words, we're establishing the density of the pest population get, that can be tolerated before an action is required. Um, and then step five, we choose appropriate control methods, so multiple methods. And then at the end, we're trying to evaluate and throughout the summer, evaluate the effect and efficacy of our uh, treatment. So the, now we're going to go into each one. And with step one, I'm going to go right away and ask everyone to raise their hand or uh, leave in the chat, what are, some of the oops, what are some of the ways that you are preventing pests on your farm? So what are the, some of the things that you've been implementing on your farm? So I'm gonna see in the chat if we have everybody. Somebody's raising their hands, Drew. Yeah, in so we've got, Oh, in the chat. Are you looking at the chat? Yeah, got so we've got there. insect netting, so preventing entry, uh, good plant nutrition, having strong plants, row cover again um, to prevent entry of the crop uh, of the pests on a, in, on a crop. Crop rotation is probably the easiest one that comes to mind typically. Um, trap cropping, so that is attracting the pest to a crop that we're not farming, but that is going to attract a particular pest that we're wanting to work with. Uh, hopes and, and prayers. Yeah, I mean, why not? <laughs> um, insect netting. Um, yeah, so a lot of, I, I suppose a lot of... Um, organic or vegetable farmer, small scale vegetable farmer use insect netting. It's one of the main thing. Good irrigation. All right. Oh, beneficial release. Yeah, a few different mentions of different versions of beneficials here, which is great. Mm -hmm. to see. Drip irrigation, probably to manage diseases so that it, the, it doesn't increase the, um, the humidity. Um, so yeah, so these are all great. Thank you. Everyone is really, there's more participation than I was anticipating. So that's <laughs> awesome. We're starting on a good note. Um, so now, I don't know. It's just not switching gear here. Um, let me, okay. Step two, we're on step two now. Um, and this is to monitor populations of pests and beneficial organism. And this slide is showing different techniques that are used to monitor for different pests. And just so you know, this is something that you'll be able to find in the literature typically. So in the literature, we'll be able to find what is the best technique to use uh, for the pests of concern. But at the top there, we have bucket traps and wing traps. These are used to monitor for moth mostly. Um, in the middle, we have a sweep net sampling method, which is just basically sweeping across a crop and you're catching a bunch of things in there, pests and beneficial insects as well. Um, and then at the bottom, we have sticky traps. Um, this is here an example of a yellow sticky trap that is used to monitor for carrot rust fly and, carrot, and carrots. And then, um, so there's other types of traps for other pests. And then we have in the middle at the bottom, leaf sampling. Um, here we have an example of someone looking at, for mites under uh, cucurbit leaves. And this is also used um, a lot for to look for aphids, mites, and thrips. 
Um, and then at the bottom, we have a la lovely lady just inspecting plants, doing visual sampling. And um, so this is something that we do a lot. Like as a farmer, you're doing that a lot as you, uh, you know, are doing the other farm activities. But um, the bottom three there are likely the ones that you're going to mostly be using as a vegetable grower. Um, so just to, yeah, to keep that, that in mind. And so the now we've looked at the technique, but we're still in step two, which is to monitor. And there's other considerations to take into account other than te the technique that you're wanting to use. So there is the location of the sample, um, the pattern, the frequency, are you going to monitor weekly, bi-weekly? Um, so, and there's different factors that will affect which protocol you're going to be using. And um, again, like this is typically something that you'll be able to find in the literature, which will be related to the pest behavior. So where can we find this pest and how is it best to monitor for it? Um, but I, I, what I want to really focus on here is to, to mention that your goal is also very important and maybe other farm activities that you're going to be doing at the same time as you're monitoring if you're really short on time. So um, what is your goal as, for this pest? And so different scenario, one scenario would be that you have a pest that you have been, um, that it has been causing a lot of damage, so moderate to high damage over the last few years, and you've implemented some management practices, maybe they're costly management practices, and then you really want to focus on doing a thorough monitoring protocol that will go throughout the summer to evaluate if you're doing the right thing. Um, the, at the opposite side of things uh, is a scenario where your neighbor maybe found a pest that is sort of new to you. You have never seen it on your farm. Um, so you would maybe implement more of a uh, surveillance type of monitoring protocol that is much more relaxed and much more like um, uh, included with your other farm activities. So, Marjo, so, yeah. just to jump in, there's a question in the chat that I think is relevant right now. Yeah. So, um, just a question about won't sticky traps also catch beneficials and possibly small snakes or birds as well? I've never used them outdoors. As yeah, well as and they will. So, they will catch ladybugs and surfeit flies and bees. And so, they, they will, but they are not. Um, when we use ticket traps, we're not using them to catch a, a large number of the pests. So it's like, you know, we're placing like three traps for carrot rust fly, for example, we're going to put like three traps in a carrot planting. So this is not considered mass trapping of this pest. So therefore it is not going to be doing mass trapping of the beneficial insects. So you are going to catch some and unfortunately they're not going to survive this adventure, but it's, it's, it's minimal numbers usually that you're going to catch, but it's a really good question. Really good question. So, um, yeah, so we're going to go back to, to, um, oh no, so I'm going to switch slides. Sorry. I was, I went back to the slide. Yeah, something, there's a little, sometimes there's a, just a little delay when I open the chat then there, I have to close the chat. Okay, um, so now we're going to be uh, talking about step three, which is to understand and identify pests. And just a side little story here, my parents have a garden center and they purchased, uh, they purchased transplants from larger nurseries. And I think it was about 10 years ago, she called me panic and she said, I have a lot, whoops, I have a lot of these things and I sprayed everything. Like there were a ton of this and I sprayed everything. She didn't know what it was. And I don't know if any of you know what this is, but this is a mummified aphid. So this is an aphid that has a little wasp developing inside. And at this stage, it is considered a beneficial insect. So the little aphid at the bottom is one that is still a pest at this point. So you know, it's important to understand what you're looking at because you could be 
uh, you know, manage, controlling something that you don't want to be, you know, um, and yeah, so this is just something to keep in mind. It's really important to understand what you're looking at. And so how do you do that? Um, you know, again, this will involve some literature search. Um, and so on the life cycle, uh, you know, things like the number of generations, uh, the overwintering, overwintering behavior, where does the pest enter the field in the spring? Is it already inside the field or is it going to be entering from the field edges? Uh, and this is not an exhaustive list. And we are in the last um, uh, framework. We are going to go over some prompting questions in the activity. But um, which stage are we most concerned about? And then what part of the plant is injured? Is it direct damage? Is it indirect damage that's going to affect the yield? What's the timing of this pest damage? So um, here is an example of a pest where there's two stages that cause damage. So this is a tuber flea beetle. Uh, this is a potato pest. And on the left, we have the adult beetle that feeds on the foliage and creates shot holes on the plants. This is damage, but potato plants are pretty tough and they can withstand a lot of damage. So we're not that concerned about this. What we're concerned about is the damage that the larvae cause on the tubers. And that's what we see on the right. So interestingly enough though, the, these larvae are in the soil. There's no way to get to them. So we target the adult for management in terms of spray management. Uh, and exclusion and things like that. So we target the adult for management. So this is important to, to understand these little, you know, these things about, about the pest that you're trying to deal with. So, and we're gonna go back to prompting questions later, but now we're in step four, which is to use economic threshold. And here we're gonna talk a lot about tolerance um, as well, but, First, I wanna establish what is a threshold. And this graph is attempting to express this, uh, this concept. So we have the red, the red there is the number of pests over time. And we can see there's two and maybe a third peak at the end there um, where uh, this pest is, is, has high numbers. And then we have the orange line, which is the economic injury level. In other words, uh, the level at which we're going to have crop loss that is significant. Um, so, and then we have the blue line, which is the action threshold. So this, this is the level of the pest at which we want to act to prevent economic loss. Okay. And in this example, this pest had two, ta two time points in the summer where that pest required some some management um, some some uh, some control so um so yeah this is a concept of threshold but if we also talk about tolerance you know this is here again a potato pet a potato that has tuber flea beetle damage for some market this is totally fine you can sell this consumers will not complain about this. And there's other market for which this is totally unacceptable. So as a farmer, you're going to have to, you know, evaluate what is the tolerance, what is your own tolerance and what is the tolerance of your consumers. You know, the, another example of that is aphids on the lettuce head. You know, likely if you're selling to farmer's market, you're going to be able to have a couple of aphids on the lettuce head, you know. So, um, you will go through, as you go through your season and the years, you likely have tolerance level of your own. And so if we continue into threshold, uh, there's pests for which we have a very well established threshold. We have a clear number to deal, to work with. And tuber flea beetles and carrot rust flies are example of that. However, at the bottom there, we have examples of pests for which we don't have a very specific number to work with. Sometimes we're working with early detection. So spider mites and cabbage aphids uh, are examples of pests that we really want to catch early 
and start acting early. And then in terms of pests, I'm sure this is to no surprise, or in terms of diseases, I'm sure this is not a surprise that we are trying to prevent, 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 prevent. So uh, we're putting a prevent, pre preventative method in place to avoid disease development, because typically once a disease is established, it's, it's harder to manage. There's things you can do, but it's, it's, we're more, much more, we're not working with threshold, we're working with prevention and early detection. And so we've talked about monitoring protocol, we've talked about threshold, and I just wanted to mention that there is a relationship between the two. So um, as an example, I'm gonna use uh, cabbage, so, uh, uh, sorry, uh, brassica crops as an example. Um, so we have a lot of very well-established thresholds that we work with for brassica crops. There's different thresholds for different brassica crops. And it's what we use is mostly based on percentage of plants with caterpillar. So you're going to use, you're going to focus, your monitoring protocol will be focused on the plant. So you're going to be inspecting the plant until you find a caterpillar um, and you're going to look at the whole plant. If the threshold was based on percentage of infected leaves, you would focus your monitoring protocol on the number of leaves that you're looking at. So again, this is something that you need to keep in mind. This is something that you'll find in the literature. And this, for this example, we're not basing our management decision on uh, the butterfly. I'm sure you've all seen this butterfly fly around and, you know, we've probably all guilty of saying, oh, well, it's time to spray, but it, we're not, this is not the stage that is targeted for spray and, and monitoring. Um, and then, so now we're in step five and it's to uh, choose appropriate control methods. And there is no silver bullet in the world of integrated pest management. So we really wanna use as many tools as possible. And this is where the toolbox analogy comes in. So um, we have cultural control methods. So how can you design your growing system to help decrease pest pressure? We have physical, we've talked about this uh, at the start. How can you physically exclude or remove the pests? Biological, how can you promote the natural beneficial organism or enhance, so adding more um, into your crop system. And then chemical, what products could you use? And we're gonna focus on that for the last activity as well. And so the last step, but not the least important one, it's often the one that is forgotten or just sort of like, you know, this is the one when you're busy, you tend to forget uh, to be consistent with, and, and it is to evaluate the effect and the efficacy of the treatments. You could be doing the wrong thing, like you could be totally doing something that is not working for years if you're not evaluating success. And how do you do that? Well, you're keeping record of pests uh, throughout the summer, throughout the years because you want to, you know, kind of uh, keep track over time of what's happening. And also alongside that, keeping notes of uh, yields, um, damage, pest damage and uh, calls um, and things like that. So um, yeah, so these are the six, six steps of IPM and we're going to go back to some of them uh, later on. Um, but this is now 